to do everything yourself in this place. You've got to move the uh, lectern and everything. Um, what do you think of the chamber? Isn't it just amazing? Yeah? You're very welcome. And I hope that in the years to come, we're going to see at least some of you sitting here as a right. Uh, I hope you all enjoyed the workshops, that you got the chance to get to know each other. And more importantly, you got the opportunity uh, to raise some of the issues that might have concerned you. As I said this morning, we're going to hear back from the workshops and listen to what was said around the issues of sexism, body image, confidence and leadership. When we were looking at the themes of the conference, I felt quite disappointed that there is still so much of a challenge and so many obstacles in the way of young women. Because that was certainly um, the issues that concern me uh, growing up and it seems uh, sad that we're still talking about it at this time. But I hope that my granddaughter's generation uh, perhaps won't have the problems that we've got. When I was reading about women in employment, I was saddened to learn that there's a report by the Girl Guidance Charity which stated that 87 per cent of girls and young women aged between 11 and 21 think that women are judged more on their appearance than on their ability. With that in mind, it's not surprising that there's been so much focus today on body image, which also feeds into confidence. I can remember when I started out in politics and when I joined for the very, very first time. I walked into a room and I was the only woman who was there and everybody else was men. Um, and I've got to say that, you know, the situation didn't improve for quite a few years, um, but that's certainly not the situation for us now in politics. It's much, much more even. Like most of us growing up, you probably don't realise yet just how capable you are. Um, in my political career, I was a very nervous public speaker. Can I tell you, I'm still nervous yet. But I can remember the one thing that gave me a lot of confidence, and that was um, I was on a platform with one of the finest speakers that I have ever heard. And just before he went up to speak, I noticed that his hands were shaking. And I thought to myself, you know, if it's OK for him to be nervous, it's OK for me to be nervous. And what is important is that, you know, no matter how nervous you feel inside, uh, you've got to be able to put on a face uh, that people uh, don't see it. We all need role models. And I think today you've seen so many role models from our politicians to our very inspiring women. And it's good too, I think, for you to see women in positions of power. It gives you somebody that you can relate to. It is hard to break the mould, but it can be easier for you if you have some inspiration as you go along. So these are just some of my thoughts. I'm keen to hear what you've been saying about these topics. And more importantly, I want to hear about what your hopes are for the future. Can I introduce a fantastic panel of female members of the Scottish Parliament. We have, uh, from the far right, Kezia Dugdale, the leader of the Labour Party in the Scottish Parliament. We have Ruth Davidson, the leader of the Scottish Conservative Party. We have Alice McInnes, MSP. No, we have Alice McInnes on the left. Uh, my script is wrong, or, or you took the wrong seat, Alison. Um, <laughs> we've got Alice McInnes from the Scottish Liberal Democrats and Alison Johnson, who is a member of Parliament for the Scottish Green Party. Can you welcome them very much here? <laughs> <laughs> and we heard from many inspiring women today, and we've invited some of them back to give some feedback from the workshops this morning. So it is a great pleasure and it's a great honour uh, to introduce to you once again Cara Henderson from Nil by Mouth, and Cara is our Scotswoman of the Year. Um, I'd like to thank the presiding officer as well as all the parliamentary staff for organising this wonderful event. And I really do mean it when I say that it's wonderful because I speak for myself when I say that I have been smiling all day, so much so that 
I've actually got an aching in my cheeks, which clearly means I don't smile enough. Um, I've been asked to sum up my impression of the event in a few words. And for me, there was probably one incident in particular which stood out for me and kind of encapsulated, I think, uh, something that which underlies all the, the, the four key, key themes to this event. And that was when we were in the workshop, we saw this video of a uh, Italy, very attractive girl, and we watched all the changes that were made to the photograph uh, before the photograph was then ready to be put in the magazine. And I was really shocked at this. Um, but what I was surprised at was a lot of, most of the girls in the workshop weren't surprised they knew that this was the case. And then we spoke about the, the fact that whether the same thing happens to men in magazines and the conclusion we reached was it probably did. But we then also spoke about the fact that um, somehow it's not as damaging for, for men for some reason. They don't, it doesn't have the same impact. And we spoke a little bit about why that was the case. And again, the conclusion that we reached in our group was that men somehow don't seem to be as critical, certainly in, in physical things, but maybe it's wider than that. They're not as critical of each other. And therefore, they don't feel they have to live up to this perfect image. And it, I felt it was quite sad, but, and it resonated with me because it was something of my own experience in school and, and later that perhaps as girls and as women, sometimes we are our own worst enemies in the sense that we criticise each other. And I think the reason that that maybe comes about, and this is again what we spoke about, was we often criticise ourselves. So we're used, to, it's, it's an extension of that really, where because we're critical of ourselves, we tend to be critical of other women. And I think maybe that is something that, that gets in our way. And I think that gets to the heart of what I think is the main issue theme from today's event. It's, it's self-confidence, that we're always measuring against some perfect image of who we think we should be. And at the same time, we're always telling ourselves that, that we're not going to get there. Um, and as I said, we're our own worst enemy sometimes for doing that. And this event, as I said, is wonderful. And I think one of the reasons it's wonderful is because there's a feeling that it, it, it's almost the opposite of that. It's a feeling of solidarity, of support. Lots of us have been nervous. I'm nervous. I can hear it in my voice. But almost by sharing that, there's a sense of empowerment. You realise that you're not alone. A lot of the things that make us think we're weird and think they're unique to us, we're all thinking it deep down. And events like this is a way of opening up and realising that we're not alone in these issues. Um, and that's why I think it's so positive. So thank you. And now I'd like to welcome Amal Azudin. Um, Amal is just a truly wonderful young woman. She saw an issue in her own community with her school friends uh, being removed um, as asylum seekers. Um, she galvanised her school, her community. Uh, she worked so hard. Um, she, there's been a film about the Glasgow girls. They have won awards. Um, there's been a stage play as well. Um, Amal, you are an inspiration. Thank you very much. Um, that was so beautiful. Thank you, President Officer. Hello, everyone. It's an absolute um, pleasure and honour to be here with you all today. And can I also say what an amazing event. Um, if uh, you guys were not inspired, I definitely was by you. Um, it's, it's absolutely fantastic. And I hope that it happens every year and that more and more young people um, are involved. Because I think um, I wish I was young again <laughs> and sitting where you guys um, were sitting. I think it's starting to become a habit, actually, because last time I was here and speaking in the chamber was for International Women's Day in the year 2010, and there was about 400 women here. So I'm back here on another women's event, so it's great. Um, the session we uh, focused on was on uh, body image and sexism. Um, so the girls looked at um, a video of a, a woman and um, she was about to get a photo shoot done and how the kind of before and after look happened. You know, she was normal, no makeup on, and then completely changed. Um, you know, everything, literally every aspect of her face was changed through Photoshop and everything. Um, and the discussion kind of focused on how there's um, an expectation to be perfect 
all the time. There's the kind of peer pressure, um, you know, to be looking fantastic and looking like all the people we see on TV and all the celebrities and how unrealistic it is. And, um, you know, some of the young people also mentioned about how angry they felt because, you know, why should uh, women uh, be put under pressure to look like um, you know, the women we see and in the magazines, etc. because, um, you know, nobody's perfect. And if you look at the kind of models or the people on TV in real life without their makeup on, they're unrecognizable, you know, and that's how different it is. Um, and also how fake it is, because it's not real. You know, the, after the Photoshop and all that, you know, it, it just doesn't make any sense. And also somebody mentioned the double standards, um, because, you know, there's not the same expectation of men to be perfect all the time and you know the kind of sometimes there's the stereotypes and in the communities it's like yeah it's okay for a man to do this but it's not okay for a woman to do it so we kind of focused on that and um, I think I'd like to finish off by saying to all the young people here today that actually it's not what you look like that defines you it's your character and what you do I hope you enjoy the rest of the day thank you very much And now uh, we have Khalida Noon. I first met Khalida uh, when she was doing such fantastic work with young women in the Sikh community. And I found the event that we had in the Scottish Parliament truly inspirational. I think Khalida is an inspirational woman too. So great pleasure to have Khalida with us today. Khalida. Thank officer. It is really um, an honour to be here today in front of all you lovely young people. And we really looked at confidence and leadership in our session today, the workshop. And a lot of girls did, were very quiet, but a few girls did have the courage to speak up and it was, uh, I loved hearing the voices. We, we looked at um, support, getting support from the right people, people that can bring out the greatness in you, and looking at role models like our two girls here who came along today to talk about their story. Although harrowing it was for them, they had that wee bit of confidence and really stood up and told their story and of how to come out of something not so nice and lead their own lives. Having, we looked at having faith in yourself as a young lady. It's really important that you do find that speck of faith in yourself to become who you want to be. A few of the girls also suggested, you know, finding something different to do, finding um, perhaps uh, getting an instrument or music or dance, drama. Maybe not at first being excellent at it, but practicing and showing people what you can do. Very important. Being a leader of your own life. Finding that speck of special something and building upon that because confidence is, there is a speck of confidence in there and it does become stronger. It does through time, it comes stronger and work on it. Build on that confidence to trust your heart and your intuition and having the courage to trust yourself. The issues raised in the workshops that many um, girls from diverse backgrounds don't have the choice to be leaders. Many girls here today have got the choice to be leaders. It's just maybe confidence that's lacking, but many of our girls, they don't have the confidence being leaders, but they also don't have the choice to be leaders. It's taken from them due to cultural barriers. Girls, you know, to take action for yourself respectfully, finding ways to become your own leader of your life, however small it may be. We really need to try and think about leadership as part of the curriculum and really focus on engaging with socially excluded girls who are not maybe allowed to attend 
and be part of extracurricular activities, all of which really build your experience. But a lot of girls aren't allowed to do that. Our organisation, we're a charity, and we work in partnership with the Royal High School and the Duke of Edinburgh Award to develop a model as a curriculum choice. So there's, there's, there's something there that the girls can choose to do at school and they get that leadership qualities and skills to become confident. This would then mainstream service and not relying on we charities like us that we have to rely on funding from places. Because, you know, the learning community and the wider community are not aware of issues affecting many girls like Sangeeta and Jazz. And it's, you know, up to us to make sure there's awareness of, of what's happening. You know, there's many Scottish girls slipping through the net in schools and living a life of social exclusion with no options, no positive destination. And, you know, there has to be a change. Girls must have the opportunity to be able to strive. And it's really important that all you girls take what you've got, what's been said today, lots of inspiring stories that, you know, the energy has been absolutely amazing, incredible, and take something with you when you leave here today and think about how you can really, truly lead your own life and become and do something totally amazing. Thank you. Thanks. Kalida, thank you very much indeed. We are now going to just move swiftly on to uh, a question session. Um, I've got all these questions that you've already submitted. So we're going to do our absolute best to get through as many as we can. Can I just say, and when I call your name, if you put your hand up and then just wait for the red light on the microphone to switch on, if you want to ask your question yourself. Some of you have indicated that you don't want to ask the question, and I'm more than happy to do it, but where you have and I uh, call your name, if you just wait and put your, put your hand up, wait on the microphone coming, and the microphone will find you. And then secondly, don't be worried about if your voice isn't very loud. We've got absolutely fantastic microphones in here, and I promise you that the microphone will be able to pick your voice up. So don't worry that your voice is really uh, quite low. Um, it's a really brilliant, friendly um, place and chamber to be in. I've always felt really at home in it. And I've got to say, looking around here, you look as though you're at home as well. I think, ladies, we've got competition in the future. <laughs> right, um, first question um, is Chloe Craighead from Peterhead Academy. Chloe, put your hand right up. Can we get Chloe's microphone on? That's it, you're on. Um, did you find your confidence was weakened when entering such a male-dominated workplace such as politics? Kithia. Go and say it again, did I feel... Um, that your confidence was weakened when entering such a male-dominated workplace such as politics is? It's, it's definitely intimidating. There's, there's no question about it. And I, I feel nervous every time I come in this chamber... Uh, even today, because there's something just so grand about it. It's a parliament. It's a really important place. And it's such a, a, an honour and a responsibility to have the opportunity to speak in it. And it, it's amazing looking at all of you. And I hope that there are people sitting in the seats today that will be MSPs in this chamber one day. But yeah, I, I'm always nervous when I'm in here. I was talking to a few of you at lunchtime and this morning about that sense of nervousness. There's nothing wrong with being nervous. It's a good thing. It's about your ability co to control it and try turning it into an energy that you can use for the better. I sit in that seat there at First Minister's Questions on a Thursday and I'm always absolutely crap in it. But it's like, <laughs> my, my legs shake. It's where you, my nerves are in my legs. Like if you saw me standing, my legs shake. My, the top half of my body's fine, so I don't necessarily look nervous. But it's all about controlling your nerves. Uh, but you should never not be nervous because the minute you stop being nervous, you get arrogant and then you make mistakes. So don't be afraid of nerves. Nerves are a good thing. It's about coping with them and using them to your advantage. Ruth. 
Yeah, I've always worked in uh, environments where there's been more men than women. So I used to be a journalist. I was a journalist for 10 years before I became a politician. I worked at the BBC. I did loads and loads of radio. Um, the first time I was asked to present a two-hour news and current affairs show of an afternoon, I vomited twice on the way to the studio. Um, so, like, actually literally threw up in a waste paper bin before I went on air. That's the, the kind of nerves that got to me. Um, and, and outside of that, I used to be in the Territorial Army, which is where I did, when you talk about leadership, that's where I got my leadership training um, on, on how to be an army officer. And some of the skills that I learned there I've transferred over into this job. And that's, you know, definitely more men than women that do that. Um, and it's not just in here. I mean, when I worked at the BBC, I was on radio for ages and I really wanted to try television. And one of my good pals, like she wasn't being bitchy, she wasn't being horrible, she was trying to be nice, took me aside and said, look, Ruth, if you want to do telly, you've got to lose a couple of stone and put on more makeup. Like that was her advice to me. And I said, oh, well, sod you then, I'm sticking in radio. Uh, <laughs> and I did. Um, so I, I'm kind of with Kez. I've always done stuff that terrifies the living crap out of me, but I've always made myself do it. And the, the, the buzz and the high that you get afterwards, like even when you're on you know, a, a late night telly show and you've got a debate with political opponents or people that are criticizing you and you're defending yourself or you're putting forward your point of view, the buzz you get from that is enormous. One of the coolest things I have ever done in my entire life, probably the coolest thing I will ever do in my entire life, was doing a debate at the Hydro in front of 8,000 young people. You know, politics shouldn't be like rock music, but the referendum was so big and so important, it captured everyone's imagination. And, and you know, saying what you wanted to say and having people listen to you, like 8,000 people in an auditorium, was just, you know, I, I didn't sleep, I didn't get to sleep till about 3 a.m. that night because it was that cool. So, yes, it is really scary sometimes, but other jobs are scary too. But just because you're scared, it doesn't mean that you can't rock it because all of you can. Alison. Can I ask for the question again, just to get to the, the nub of it? Did you, f did you find your confidence was weakened when entering such a male-dominated workplace such as politics? Um, I would say I probably did. When I think about some of my first experiences, because I came from education, which is a world that was probably dominated by women, one of my first experiences was in the council chamber just up the road in Edinburgh. And I remember a male councillor basically shouting at me so much that I nearly took my seat again. Um, I'm really pleased to say now those meetings are webcast, and I hope that behaviour will improve. But I think sometimes it's a bit of a testosterone fueled environment. And I'd really like to see more women involved. I think if we had more women in this chamber, and certainly more women in our council chambers, where there's an even bigger shortage, we might start to see a different tone of debate. Now, gradually through time, I found my feet and my confidence, and he certainly wouldn't have me reacting in that manner now, but I don't think it's helpful. That same debate, that same person referred to another, a woman senior councillor as a fishwife, um, and nobody batted an eyelid. So, <laughs> you know, we, we have to improve the level of our debate. Um, I don't find it any more challenging now because I've got used to it, but I don't think it should be challenging at all. But I, I absolutely agree with, with Kezia and Ruth. It's, it's good to have some nerves. Although the thing that always astonishes uh, me, I, w I was involved in athletics for 15 years, and whenever I come in here, do I, I kind of will say sometimes to the office, I don't feel as nervous as I would if I was going to run an 800 metres, because this doesn't hurt. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I would say what they have in common is the fact that if you're well prepared, you will do yourself justice, and I think that gives you confidence. Alison. Um, yes, I think moving into any male-dominated area does sap your confidence a little bit to start with. Um, this wasn't the most male-dominated area that I entered because I've been here for eight years, but for 15 years before that, I had been in the council, as those of you that were in the workshop with me this morning knew that. And so 15 years ago on councils, they were heavily dominated by men. And I was frequently talked over the top of or dismissed, and it took a long time to find my feet there. So it, that was a good learning ground for me um, to, to, to come into Parliament here, and it's not so daunting. Um, but like everyone else, it's always very nerve-wracking in here, especially for big, important debates. Thank you, Alison. You could have kept it going another 30 seconds. OK. Um, next question is from Lucy Stanage from Preston Lodge High School. If you could raise your hand, Lucy. Up the very back. Keep your hand up. That, your mic's on. OK. 
No? Okay. How have you dealt with people who are negative towards your ambitions and tell you that you can't do it or you won't succeed? Ruth? Um, I've gone out and shown them. I've been told I can't do stuff forever in lots of different areas of my life. And it just is the one thing that really makes me want to stick two fingers up to people. I think that's possibly just because I'm, I'm a very cussed individual. Um, so there's lots of things that I've done that I was told I wasn't allowed to. So I wasn't allowed to play football for my local under 14 boys team. And then I became the first girl that did. I was told I'd probably never walk again when I got run over by a truck and I made damn sure that I could. I was told that I would probably never be I would never get elected as a Tory in Glasgow, and I have. I was told that I wouldn't be able to be leader of the party within six months of becoming an MSP, and I did. Um, that's mostly because I really hate people making assumptions on my behalf of what I'm able to do. That's not for anybody else to tell me what I can and can't do. It's up for me to decide what I want to do and then go out and work as hard as I can to achieve it. Um, I was really lucky growing up that my my family was always very supportive. Um, and, and the one thing that my mum always said, it's always stuck with me, two things actually. The first is that nobody's better than you are and you are better than nobody. So you've got to treat everyone as you'd like to be treated yourself and don't let anybody do you down. And the second thing is, I don't care how good you are as long as you've tried your best. So I got a rollicking, I absolutely remember this, in second year at high school, my mum gave me a rollicking because I got a two for effort in science, even though I'd got a one for my grade because I could have tried harder. And, you know, that was always the thing. It was always about trying your best. So um, people who tell me that I'm not up to something usually find pretty quickly that that's the one thing that makes me want to give them a total smackdown. Alison. I think that's a great question. And I do think, you know, Ruth's giving you a fabulous answer there. It's all about just being, you know, quite determined, quite focused, prepared to put in the time and the effort. You know, really don't take no for an answer if you want to achieve something and don't necessarily model yourself on someone else. You know, just think about where it is you want to go, where you are now. And I think get a good team of supportive people around you. If there are naysayers, just say, well, you know what, if you want to sit there and be negative, that's your prerogative, but I'm determined I want to achieve something. Don't take no for an answer. And I think we've had a really good discussion this morning about the need for other women to be kind to one another, to be supportive, to mentor each other, to help each other. And as we've said, you know, we're all here and really willing to be contacted and to help you in any way we can, because the support is out there if you want to find it. But just don't take no for an answer. Alison. Well, if someone says, no, you can't do that to me, it tends to have the adverse effect. And I do tend to get very determined. Um, I, I'm a different generation from these, these young women here. Um, and I was told much more often in the 1970s that girls didn't do these kind of things. Um, and I told you about my, my physics teacher when I was at school, when I was in the 1970s, who didn't answer questions when, I, when a girl asked uh, the question because he told us he couldn't do science. And that kind of attitude made me very determined. And, and, and quite um, determined to, to, to prove a different pathway for myself and for my daughter and to use this parliament to speak up for, for, for young women at every opportunity that I could. Alison's right. I think um, if someone says, if you're determined you want to do something, then ask for help to do it. Don't be afraid to ask your friends and colleagues for help because actually people are usually more than willing to help you reach your um, ambitions. Kezia. The last time somebody told me not to do something, and I did it anyway, you gave me a really big row. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm, and I'm going to tell the story, because I, I think it might tickle people. But when I first got elected, we had a debate in the chamber about affordable childcare. And Save the Children, the charity, were in the building, and they gave all the MSPs these simulator babies, you know, the ones that cry every now and again, and that they pee and they exist like real babies. <sighs> And I thought it'd be a really smart idea to bring it into the chamber and do my speech with the baby in my arms. And, and I did it and I got such a row from Trish. You wouldn't believe uh, how much I got put in my place for that. But, and I wouldn't do it again. I wouldn't break the rules again because I did disrespect Parliament. It was against the rules and this is a serious building. And, but what I was trying to do was to say um, how hard it was for women to, to get involved in life but if they have childcare responsibilities. And I, I cracked a joke trying to say, you know, I couldn't find any childcare and Trish didn't find it very funny. <laughs> She may expect to be such a bad person. Uh, right, there's no name on this one, but I think it's a really, really good question, so I'm going to pose it anyway. Do you ever feel like you're not good enough for your job? 
Uh, Alison. Yeah, yes. it's Alison. Yes. Um, I was talking to some of the people in my workshop this morning about something called imposter syndrome. Um, and that's when you move into a new area of work or you go to um, a new course at the university or at the college and you walk into the room and you look around and you think, oh my goodness, everybody in here is brighter than me or everybody's doing a better job than me. And girls in particular do this quite a lot. I've talked to um, teachers and to university lecturers and they say that girls then rather... They, so the next part of that is that they say, I'm going to fail. I'm not as good as these people. And then they talk themselves back out of the door and they themselves remove themselves from that particular arena because they feel they're not good enough. And, and it, it's a well-known um, psychological kind of syndrome and, and we encourage it in ourselves, I think, particularly those women who are less confident. And it's something I struggled with quite a lot when I first came into politics, partly because so many other um, very... Um, typical type of politicians were there. So the, the ones that could stand up and make a good speech, the ones that could, uh, you know, debate for, for England or for Scotland indeed, you know, and, and, and we're very good at that. I'm still not a great debater. Um, I still get nervous in large situations like this, um, but I've learned to overcome that imposter syndrome and I think that's one of the things that everyone should do. Just remember that you are good enough. You're usually better than the other people in the room. You're at least as good as them and you must believe in yourself. Kez? Yeah, um, it, it doesn't happen very often now because I try and control it, but it, it definitely does happen. And, and I'll give you an example. About 10 days ago, I did question time and it didn't go well. Like the, the audience booed me and I, I was like really struck by that. I was really thrown by that. I didn't know how to handle that. And I, I went home that night and looked at Twitter and pretty much everything people were writing about me was negative. And I got really upset about it because I thought, you know, maybe, maybe I'm not cut out to be deputy leader of my party. Maybe this has all gone a bit too fast. Maybe I need to slow down. And for a few days after that, I was really low. But then I, I did another interview, like a radio interview that went much better. And I remembered again that I could do this and I was good at it. So it doesn't happen all the time, but sometimes things happen. They trigger your, your, your weaknesses. Your, your, you know, you say they push your buttons. It's just this has to be a phrase that somebody uses or a word or, you know, a memory. And it can make you feel really crap. It doesn't, you can't let it happen all the time. But to say you're immune to it in politics is, is nonsense. It hurts everybody at some point. Ruth? Yeah, um, I, I don't know, it's, it's something I've struggled with. Um, nobody's all front all the time. Um, when I was growing up, I've, I've got a big sister. She's really smart, really thin, really pretty. She's now a doctor, she's a consultant for the NHS. She was head girl of the school, she got five A's. I'm none of these things, I did none of these things. Um, when I went to university, I went to university at 17. Um, lots of people, I went to Edinburgh, lots of people were like, came up from England, had done A-levels, I'd done hires. They'd all gone off for gap years. They were all like 20, had been to posh schools, all that sort of stuff. And I really struggled. Um, in my head, I didn't know the difference between the difference between intelligence and knowledge. I didn't have the confidence because these people talked louder than me. Uh, I called them braying yas. Um, you know, the difference between 17, 20, 21 is quite big. The self-belief that they had, the the fact that a lot of the university courses were taught to the A-level syllabus meant that they were miles ahead of, of where I was. I really, really struggled at university. Um, I was really ill at university because I struggled with it. Um, and I, I kind of had to come back from that. And it's like Kez says, like you, you, still have, you still have the kind of crying in the night st stuff. You still have time where you get kicked around. When I took over as leader of the party, um, I was really green. I was really inexperienced. Um, there were lots of people that didn't want me to be leader of my party. Uh, there were lots of people who continued to not want me to be leader of the party after I'd been doing it for a while. I'm really proud. I'm really competitive. I had to make all of my mistakes in public, and I got kicked around in the press for a good 18 months after I took on this job, and it was tough, really, really tough. But you do build on that, and you do decide what's important and what's not important. And... Uh, You've got to know yourself when you've done, you've got to judge yourself rather than let other people judge you. So you've got to decide, yeah, do you know what, actually, that was all right. I did FMQs well today or, you know, I won that debate on television tonight or, do you know what, I've done this great thing for a constituent and I've got, you know, I've, I've managed to find a special school for their child because they didn't want them in mainstream education or I've, I've been able to deliver for something, I've done something well. But when you see people 
on television um, giving it all front, that's not all they are, because there's always the questions that go on behind it. And, and I think from what Alison said before, there is a real man-woman difference in this. There's a, a, a really famous psychological experiment that happened, which was putting two job adverts in the papers and asking people whether they wanted to apply for them or not. Mm -hmm. And it had like 10 things you had to do in order to apply for the job. And like, if men had four, they would apply. If women had less than eight, they wouldn't. Because women have to think that they're going to be, you know, they, they have to think that they already have everything that's being asked for. They'll never wing it in the way that men will. And I, I think that probably the sort of self-doubt is, is greater, or, or, or certainly the, the being able to admit to not being all front is greater amongst women and in politics. Um, during the, the referendum, I was quite close to um, the old Labour of the, leader of the Labour Party, Joanne Lamont. Um, I used to work for the old leader of the Conservative Party, Annabel Goldie. And, and I know that I'm not the only person that questions whether I'm right to be doing this, whether I'm good enough to be doing this, whether my performances are up to scratch, whether there aren't people that could do this better than me, whether I'm letting people down by not being good enough. And these questions always come and haunt you, always. Alison. Yeah, I think sometimes you might think somebody else, you need to have the self-confidence to know that although somebody else might do it differently than you, they're not necessarily doing it better. Um, that's a lesson that's taken me a long while, you know, a long time to learn. And I think you have to take responsibility too for how you feel in a situation because sometimes other people will try to make you feel bad about yourself. And I always a quote that Eleanor Roosevelt um, you know, gave always sticks in my mind. No one can make me feel inferior without my consent. So simply just keep a bit of distance between yourself. You know, just keep a bit of yourself sort of firm and solid in there and say, I'm simply not going to be made to feel bad. I mean, I personally wouldn't advocate never read the comments under a newspaper article. <laughs> Don't get too bogged down in Twitter. I think it's much harder for you girls now growing up with all the social media because what sticks in your mind? See if you got 50 comments and 49 of them were really positive. What's the one that you cling on to and think about the most? I don't know why that is, but we always think about the negative things more. We can build them up and give them too much space in our heads. So think about all the people who love and support and admire you, the people who really are your friends that are there for you, and just have that self-belief and we all have self-doubt, we're only human, but I think when it comes into your head, just say, out you go. One thing I used to do when I came in here, I'd be thinking, this is a big day, I'm feeling quite nervous about it, and then I'd think to myself, regardless of what happens, I'm going to do this today, so there's two, there's two options here. I can either enjoy it, or I can grit my teeth and sort of fight my way through it. So I used to write in quite bold pen at the top of speeches, enjoy. And I think that helps, because you're doing it, it's a huge privilege, just try and enjoy it, and I think that makes a difference. I think, you know, one of the big problems uh, that we have is that, you know, if you don't have a lot of self-confidence, you feel throughout your life, I'm going to be found out, I'm not good enough, that, you know, people will start saying that. And I can remember way back in 1992, because I'm really quite old, um, the first time I ever... Uh, wanted to stand for election and it took me quite a lot of time to decide that this is what I wanted to do and we went for what was called a vetting weekend where the party decided whether you were good enough and there must have been about 60 or 70 people on this weekend and about two nights before it I took cold feet and I thought I can't do this I'm just not good enough I can't possibly do it um, I'll be found out all these people are better than me um, so I decided not to go, and a very, very good friend of mine um, said, don't be stupid, you know you're better than some of them. I said, no, 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 I'm really awful. Uh, anyway, he persuaded me that I really ought to go, um, so I went, and then once I got there, um, I suddenly realised, uh, after about 10 minutes, that about a quarter of the people who were on the course um, were much, much better than me. Um, about half of them were absolutely crap. Um, and I was probably in um, the next group, so I wasn't the best, I certainly wasn't the worst, um, and I self-assessed myself within, you know, the sorry, uh, next 25%. And I know at that point the SNP were so desperate for candidates, they were not going to fail half a course. So I decided in that case I was fine, and I certainly um, I passed it, but, you know, I was within 
you know, inches of not going because I didn't think I was good enough. And I think sometimes you've got to sit back and um, take encouragement where you can get it. And secondly, look around you and be honest about yourself. And it isn't arrogance to say that you're better than some. It just is a fact. You know, as long as you recognise that, you know, you might not be the best, but you're not the worst either. And I think that really helped me enormously. Um, we've got the four subjects and I've got millions of questions. Um, so we're going to go into the next section on gender inequality and sexism. Um, we've got a question from Dana Shields of St. John Ogilvy High School. You want to keep your hand up, Dana? Right, you're on. Okay. Do you feel that particular TV shows and films that include introverted female characters encourage young women to be more like them rather than powerful female leaders? Um, I think... Sorry, if, if I if I'll yep. go first. Um, I, I think, um, Dana, you do absorb things that are in popular culture. So you absorb things on television and films and everything. Um, I think there's... A, for every kind of Lara Croft out there who's toting guns or barbed wire or, you know, um, any of these sort of female superheroes, there's always the sort of damsel in distress that needs a man to save them. Um, and I think that that's, uh, that can, can sort of permeate people's views of, of sort of gender stereotypes and roles. But, I mean, I think there's a, a real issue for bright, smart, articulate young women like yourselves to, to stand up and to change a script um, in your own lives. And a lot of, of the media is a reflection of, of life itself. And, and um, like I say, I, I used to work in the BBC, we had our own drama department and all the rest of it. And the ideas that they were kicking around, um, the writers in there were ideas that they were, and conversations they were having in the pub, there were conversations they were having with people in real life uh, and all the rest of it. So, I, I mean, I think that there is a real incumbency on, on all of us um, to make sure that that we push to get the scripts change, if you know what I mean, just even in our own lives as well as, as in the sort of media sense of that. Alison. I think that's a very good point. It was um, Denise Minor, you know, the, the, mm. the, the novelist, I went to hear her speak, and she was the first person that was sort of put into my mind, it was a few years ago at an amnesty event, the need to change that narrative. Because we're all used to reading crime fiction where something dreadful happens to the victim, <coughs> in 95% of cases the woman, who is then rescued by the big burly detective who, you know, mostly is a bloke. So there is a need to, to sort of empower women through the media. And too often we are... You know, even if you look at something like an event like the Tour de France, there's the gallant winner and there's two women in you know, bikinis presenting him with his trophy. I mean, I've always been interested in sport and I think it has a long way to go. If you pick up any newspaper today, you'll be lucky if you can find a picture of a woman doing sport on the back pages. Apparently, that is just for men. And that's because one in 10 sports journalists, you know, is a woman. So there's a long way to go. Part of that starts off at school, starts off with things like not having pink Lego, you know, it starts off with just demanding that apprenticeships see equal numbers of men and women in a variety of roles. But I think broadcast print media has such an impact that it's really important that we challenge that and maybe, you know, just let broadcasters know that we'd like more varied fare. Alison? Yeah, I mean, I think broadcast media in particular has an insidious effect if it doesn't reflect society as it really is. And it just obviously reinforces, repeatedly reinforces stereotypes and, and particular cultures. And you'll hear many women um, in, in the media, be they women journalists or um, actors, who say that after a certain age they're not welcome on television. And that in itself is, is also another problem. So we must just, as, as Ruth said, ask for more, demand more, just keep uh, changing the channel when you find something that you like with strong women in it. Yes. Yeah, it's really interesting, Alison, that you mentioned Denise Mina because that's my favourite crime author and she makes a point of writing um, books set in Glasgow, and most of them are set in Glasgow, where the, the strong characters are the women and they're, they're crime stories, but all the people that die are the men. And she kind of highlights the fact that, you know, crime novels don't have to see women as victims all the time. So if, you're, if you like crime novels, look out for Denise Mina. But I was picking up my phone there because there's a, there's a name for the test for the media. And I couldn't remember it. It's the Bestel test. You should have a wee look at that. But that's a test you can set against every uh, TV programme, every soap opera, every film that you watch. And you have to look for two women to be talking to each other at the same time about something which isn't another man. 
and they call that the Bechdel test. So the next time you're watching a TV programme or a film, see if you can spot that, because uh, you won't, because uh, the vast majority of the time it's women talking about men on our TV screens. Uh, sorry. And just, sorry, just one final point. There aren't enough female journalists, uh, particularly in political journalism, and that reflects in the way that they write about politics, because what you end up is lots and lots of stories about today a fight broke out or a row broke out about this. You don't get stories in the round. I was thinking about this the other day, Trish. I don't think there's a single political journalist that writes for a Sunday newspaper in Scotland now. So every single uh, word you read about politics in a Sunday newspaper is written about a man, is written by a man, uh, and I think that's fundamentally wrong. I, I'm just going to comment? jump in one yeah. more. Also, the media kind of goes through phases. So it went through a phase where it liked having women coppers. So you had like Jane Tennyson and all the rest of it. Um, I'm, I'm an openly gay woman, so I always look for gay characters on TV. There's much more uh, in terms of lesbians being on television now. But I swear to God, every single one of them dies tragically. So that's the <laughs> next thing that we have to do. Like whether it's, you know, whether that's like a car crash, whether that's uh, in lip service, whether that's anything else. So I've noticed that kind of on Twitter, um, uh, people that follow Stonewall and, and myself and, and others have now started ragging uh, TV companies every time they have a lesbian die tragically and people have to cry over it. So we're trying sort of externally to force there to be openly gay characters who actually survive. So that's, that's the next step for me. <laughs> so that's what I'm working on right now. <laughs> All right, OK. Um, Jessica Emery, Perth Academy. Jessica? Yes, here's Jessica. Right, that's your mic on, Jessica. Um, do you ever think full gender equality will be achieved? If so, how? Alison. Um, I think I have to believe it will. I, know I think we have to really be positive about this and assume it's going to happen because it has to happen. We need to have an equal, fair society. But I think we're going to need to see legislation. You know, parliaments are probably going to have to legislate so that you can't put forward a slate of candidates that isn't gender balanced. I think it's fair to say that my own party comes closest to achieving that at the moment. But it's not just about saying, we've said as a party, if it's a winnable seat, 50% of candidates have to be women. And if it's a, you know, a seat in general, it has to be 40-40 at least. But as well as that, you have to put supportive mechanisms in place. I think women do find it harder to get involved in all walks of life because they're still primary, the primary carers, whether it's children or older people. You know, lots of women are doing unpaid work that stops them getting involved. There are barriers around women are simply less well off. You know, they're less affluent. Um, they're impacted more by cuts and so on. So some of them don't have that choice. So there's a lot that we have to do. But I absolutely do believe I, I feel as if I'm seeing a change myself since I got involved in politics. I think this is an issue that's been spoken a lot about more, a lot more. You know, 10 years ago, it just really wasn't an issue. Nobody would have said, if there was a panel on TV, nobody would have said, oh, look at that panel of men in grey suits. Whereas now people are challenging it. Even some men are challenging it. And I think, you know, the film with Emma Watson that we saw earlier, He for She, you know, I mean, gender equality isn't about pitting the genders, you know, head to head. It's about saying, right, let's work together so that all our children, regardless of gender, have got truly equal opportunities. Alison. Well, yes, like Alison, I think we have to strive for it, and I think we will get there. But the pace of change is glacial at the moment. As I said this morning, I was um, a 16-year-old um, in the early 1970s, and we had the Sex Discrimination Act. And there was a great sense of excitement that things were going to change, and things have not changed as much as they should have. And some of that's our fault, that we have taken our eye off the ball that we, th we thought the problem was fixed with the legislation. And actually, we've got so many institutions that are institutionally biased, that, that bring about gender balance. Much of the focus I've found in the last um, decade has been about fixing the women. So it's, oh, women are not confident enough, or women are not able, they don't come forward, so we need to work with the women. Well, yes, there are some of those things that we need to do, but the institutions themselves, so the universities, the colleges, these places of power, need to also change the way that they work so that they work for women. And when we do that, then we'll see women taking the rightful place. But it's in your hands. You're young women, and you need to demand it. You need to ask us to focus much more. Tricia said she wanted to hear from you today about what it is that we need to do here to make that change for you and to make the change work faster. Yes. I have to believe that gender equality is possible, but I am fed up waiting. 
and there are generations of women that came before me that are fed up waiting too and how long are we going to have to wait are we just going to do something about it so just after the referendum uh, Alison Johnston and I set up a campaign called Women 50-50 uh, Alison voted yes, I voted no and we thought straight after the referendum what we wanted to do was to say as two women we could unite together and talk about gender equality and changing the law so that this building, this parliament um, would be 50-50 forevermore so the campaign's about saying to parliament that you have to field 50% female candidates, 50% male candidates just like they do in eight other European countries so that if this parliament was equal in terms of gender it would make better policy for the whole of the country uh, and I think that would be a, a really important step and right now you've got you know Nicola Sturgeon is our first minister which is fantastic and groundbreaking it's really really going to change young women's attitudes to their place in politics in the world you've got me sitting over there um, leading the Labour Party in here and Ruth over there um, speaking for the Tories three women at the front of politics in Scotland that's fantastic four. but four well absolutely <laughs> Absolutely, but we're just talking in party politics terms. But it won't always be that way, Trish. One of us is going to screw up. It's just a matter of time. And then there will only be two. That'll be me, just if anyone's asking. <laughs> and then what happens? So I think the, our legacy to Parliament could be that we have a 50-50 Parliament. Uh, I, yes. Similar to, to the other three, I, I have to believe it's going to happen. I think it's to have true gender equality that it, it goes beyond having to make legislation. It's that we've got to a stage where that's no longer needed to either protect, empower, support or promote. Um, one of the things that makes me um, excited for the fact that the pace of change could speed up is that we're now seeing more women than men go to university, more women than men joining some of the preserves that used to be male preserves, so more women than men joining the medical profession, more women than men now in Britain anyway, joining the legal profession. And these are they're all gradual ways forward in which they were, were tearing down the walls, but, but by God, it has been gradual. Um, when I was uh, 11, um, Margaret Thatcher resigned and we got a new prime minister and, and my, my best pal's mum, I used to go to my best pal's after, after school, my best pal's mum came in, has told me that, came in and said that the new prime minister was a, a, a guy called John Major. Uh, and I turned to Jill and said, can a man even be Prime Minister? Because in my head, I'd only ever known a woman. We had the Queen, we had the Prime Minister, and they were both women. Uh, and I didn't know that a man could be. We need to get to the stage where, you know, hopefully having Nicola Sturgeon here, you know, that's a promotion of that. And, and there will be young women going, can a, can a man even be First Minister? You know, and we can start making it the norm rather than something that's... that's um, you know, that's remarked upon or remarkable in and of itself. Uh, and, and I hope that as we have more women going to university, more women going into profession, more women coming into politics, and all of these other ways, we can make this the norm so that it doesn't have to be something that is, like I say, supported, promoted, legislated, all the rest of it. We just get to win because, by God, we've been waiting long enough in order to win. OK. Um, I think it's Courtney Laird from Wallace High School. Or some delayed. Yep. Yeah. Young lady here. What's your name? Courtney. Courtney, I was right. Do you think the most hurtful things that's said about other women actually come from other women? The most hurtful things that are said um, about women come from other women. Uh, Alison, I think you're cutting off this time. Uh, no. I think some of them can be, but I don't think the most hurtful things that have been said have, to me have been said by other women. But I do know that we don't support each other as much as we should, and that we should um, really um, be much more supportive to each other and, and less condemnatory, less willing to um, talk about superficial things and criticise other, other friends and, and, and women on, on that way. But um, I think for you, it's much more difficult, I think, probably, if you were on social media and you're on Twitter, then it might well be the case that some of the most vicious things are coming from other young women. And, and that would be... That's something that you need to think about and we need to think about ourselves. Is that, is that how you want your own daughters to talk to each other? Kez? I said to this, I, th I think it was in our group we were talking about this earlier, I think there's something about a society that teaches boys to hurt with their fists and teaches women to hurt with words. So I think sometimes women can do more damage with words, we get craftier with it, we can be bitchier. I don't think there's anything inevitable about it, I don't think it's 
you know, it doesn't have to be that way. But I think because we are viewed as less violent, we choose to do more harm with words. So I try and be very, very careful with the language I use. I get it wrong sometimes, totally. But um, in the last few months, I think um, we, we certainly look after each other. Um, Nicola and Ruth in the last few weeks have, have looked after each other in particular when they're so exposed to the media. Yeah, I mean, Ruth? I, I think I am um, similar to, to Kez and Alison. Um, I think women can say the most hurtful things. I think sometimes when it comes from another woman, it can appear more hurtful to, to you sometimes. Um, I think, too, though, that we have the opportunity to do things that inspire each other more, that do the things that really build each other up rather than tear each other down. I think some of the best, in fact, all of the really strong mentors or inspirations in my life, whether they were school teachers, sort of... A, you know, a, a minister of mine, whether it was um, a, a, an elder co-worker of mine that really brought me on, the people that have really spent time with me, the people that have really supported me, the people that have really pushed me when I was worried about whether I could do something or not, they were all women. And I've always tried to, you know, if, if somebody needs that extra hand, to be able to spend the time with them. Because, you know, I absolutely fully sign up to and believe, as trite as many people say it is, that women are the stronger sex in terms of force of will, in terms of resilience, in terms of determination, and in terms of warmth, comfort, love, support. We get this better than men. We are better at supporting each other if we choose to do so than men are. We are more articulate. We are able to inspire better. And I think that each and every one of you has a choice to make many times over in your own life about which road you go down. It's whether you tear people down or whether you build them up. And I hope everyone in this room chooses to build people up. Alice? Yeah, we had a discussion about this in one of the, the, the group I was with first this morning. And I think the young women in that group felt that young women weren't necessarily more unkind, that they'd had some really you know, unpleasant experiences at, at the hands of young men. And they felt it was more of a personality thing, an individual choice rather than than a gender one, maybe we're more surprised and horrified when we could be supporting other women and we're actually attacking them, even if it's verbally, because a lot of these names, they do kind of stick in your head and you can't get rid of them. So I think we need to, we need to challenge each other to expect better behaviour and just say, you know, what, why would you say that? Are you feeling a bit low yourself today? What, what's making you, you know, attack me in that manner? Do you want to have a chat about this? Because I really think we could do better than this. So I wouldn't accept it, I would challenge it, um, because we can get to a situation where supporting one another is the norm, and I've been well supported, I, I probably would say again, in particular by women throughout my career, not to say there haven't been some supportive men, but I think the support we can get from one another is truly worth working for, so do challenge anything that's less than supportive. Alison, have you answered that one? Yeah, you did. I started with you. Right, um, Sarah Cunningham, Castlehead High School. S Sarah, show me your hand. Right, uh, Sarah's to my right. So nice. That's it. Excellent. Thanks, Sarah. <coughs> um, who inspires you the most in your life and why? Brooke Kez. Who inspires you? I wondered if they'd ask about who, who's the most like, inspirational figure. I thought you were going to ask about computer games. We had a good chat earlier about women and uh, doing computer programming. Um, it, the woman that's most inspired me politically is Doreen Lawrence. So um, that's, that's where I found my politics was around um, the death of a guy called Stephen Lawrence. He was, he was killed in the 90s by a, a gang of white boys in, in London. And um, she fought back and ran a campaign for the best part of 20 years to prove that the police were institutionally racist. And, um, and I did my modern studies um, projects on it at school and I was interested in it all the way through my law degree and all the way through my life because she managed to take on the system in such a dignified and rational and human way um, it, it just it, it has always inspired me. And, and now she's, a house, she's a, in the House of Lords, she's the Baroness, uh, Doreen Lawrence and you know I want to get rid of the House of Lords it's an archaic institution but my god I'm glad she's there uh, and I just think she's an incredibly inspirational woman and if you're not familiar with the story you should google it after today. Ruth? Um, I guess I was a bit of a weirdo growing up and I, I always kind of like books um, more than people and they sort of inspired me so the, the biggest inspirations I had growing up 
um, were fictional characters. One of them was the fictional character of Henry V in the Shakespeare play, and the other one was the fictional character of Atticus Finch in uh, um, uh, To Kill a Mockingbird. Uh, and the thing that, that unites them both is they're both about... Um, doing what is right no matter how difficult that is and staying true to your own beliefs and not letting external pressures stop you in what you believe that it is that you should do and I, I think that's something that everybody should try to live up to if if we're talking about sort of politics and real life politicians that are alive today um, I guess that the person that I would point to is a, a, a woman who uh, leads a country in Africa she leads Liberia her name is Ellen Johnson Sirleaf she um, became the president of Liberia um, and she, she had a, a really tough uh, leadership campaign. Um, she's from Liberia. She went over and studied in the States. Was a very eminent. Uh, I, th I think she was a, a, a she was an accountant first, and then an economist. And she came back because she wanted to help her country because her her country was was broken and bleeding. And she she ended up running against the most famous footballer that Liberia had ever produced, a guy called George Weah, uh, who played in the English Premiership. And like all of the media were interested in him. He was wanting to do this kind of as a feather in his cap. Um, in, in terms of being the most, he was the most famous African footballer at the time, he just ret required, retired. And she won because she went from village to village and set up women in the villages that wanted to vote for Mama Ellen. And it was about ha being the, the sort of embodying the motherhood of, of her country. Now, Liberia is a tough country. You know, there have been some mistakes that she's made. She's, she's you know, it's, it's, it's a really, really difficult region to operate in with the, the, the sort of countries that are around it. But in terms of how you run a campaign, how you empower women who were always seen as second-class citizens, um, who didn't always vote, sometimes who gave their votes to the men um, in their families to vote on their behalf, she ran the most fantastic campaign and is the first female democratically elected leader over there and is you know, an absolute inspiration for how she managed it. Alison. I'm going to mention another African woman, and it's interesting, maybe it's because they've had to face such um, adversity, but Wangari Matai, who was a, a Kenyan woman who founded the Green Belt Movement, and she started doing that because when the floods came to her, to her neighbourhood, all the produce and everything was being swept away because clearances had just meant there wasn't a tree in sight, and she just got a group of women together, and at first the authorities told them that they didn't even have the know-how to plant a tree and that they needed to go on a special course. Really, I'm not making this up. Um, and she got these Kenyan women together and they planted thousands of trees and sort of re-established agriculture and were able to make a living from themselves. And she went from a really very ordinary, impoverished background to becoming a professor and won the Nobel Peace Prize. So uh, she's someone who, uh, you know, whose aim sit very much at the, the fore of my heart. And there's a group of Kenyan Scots in Edinburgh who meet quite regularly and do a bit of you know, planting with them, just getting together and sort of reminding ourselves about her legacy and how it's one that could apply to, you know, a community near you, really. Alison. Um, I draw a lot of inspiration from a writer called Maya Angelou, um, who was an activist in America. Um, she worked alongside Martin Luther King. She overcame great personal adversity um, and t went on to be a great writer, singer, actress. Um, and I often turn to hard words um, to find a way through th difficult situations. Um, politically, I would say Shirley Williams, who's um, of a different generation again, but um, a, a woman who set up comprehensive schools um, that you all now go to um, and who's in the Liberals and has always championed the individual dignity of, of, of people from wh whichever gender they are. But you know what? The more I look around and the more I do this job, the more I see inspirational women every single day. And they're there in your community. Just look around you, look in your schools, look in your communities, and you'll see people who are doing all sorts of things against the odds and doing it well. Um, we've got one final question. Um, there's no name here, um, but it's somebody from the Noon Grammar School. Um, if you had three genuine real wishes, anything at all, what would you do for teenage girls in today's society? Who's to start with that one? I knew, I'll, but we always leave the hard ones till the end. All right, even one wish. What, what do you wish for these young women? the strength to know deep down that there is nothing that they can't do. 
But in terms of wishes of things that we can practically do to make things better, I think that they're one of the things that I would like to see um, a lot of, of change in is um, one, the representation of, of women in mainstream media. So that's some of the things that you were talking about earlier in terms of magazine articles, televisions, all the rest of it. And actually one of the other things that I would I'd quite like to see, and, and I might not be able to articulate this very well, so, so please bear with me. Um, I, I think with the advent of video on like mobile phones and, and tablets and stuff, one of the things that's really difficult um, is because there's so much pornograph porn around and people watch it all the time and it's funny and people show it to each other in class and all the rest of it. I think there's a real difficulty for young boys as well as young women growing up of what is expected of them when they start having relationships and what and how you treat each other in that and, and even and even what you're supposed to look like in, in some ways. Oh my God, there's hair. Wow, who knew? Um, but I mean, I think there's a, a real, real difficulty in terms of the sort of self-respect that you have to have in what other people expect of you and some of the names that you're called growing up if you don't do certain things, some of the names that you're called if you do do certain things, and the pressure that young women and young men have now is so much more than it was, you know, even when I was at high school when those pressures were there, but they're, they're much, much stronger. And, and with, with things like, you know, sort of, texting photos being sent around schools, texting videos being sent around schools, as well as stuff that you see on RudeTube or any of these other sort of, or Pornhub or any of these other sites as well. I think the sexualization uh, that happens really dents a lot of young people's self-respect and what is expected of themselves in their own communities. And, 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 and I think that's something that nobody is articulating, but it's a conversation that we need to have more widely. One of the other things? Go for okay. it, Alison. Um, yeah, I um, have a teenage daughter, and I, I think if I was to wish anything for her uh, and for you all here, I think resilience. You know, when I go to parents' night, I, I'm not so... I think leaving school with the ability to bounce back from the difficult situations that you will encounter is massively important. You know, if, if you know that you're managing to, to get through your workload and so on, and you're getting your, your, your courses all okay. I think school should be about more than that. It really should equip you with the tools to bounce back, to dare to fail, to not be afraid of making mistakes. But I would wholeheartedly agree with what Ruth said. If there's one thing we could challenge in society, because I read figures about bullying this morning, it's absolutely horrendous. And it's not like the bullying we were subjected to at school. I think it's worse because it's more insidious. A lot of it's invisible. We've heard stories of you know, young people who are quite happily walking along the road to school and then they get that text message and they instantly feel sick, afraid, ashamed, just horrible. And it's how we go about tackling that culture because you know, we're hearing more and more about young people who are self-harming, feeling suicidal, it's having an impact on their whole life. So I'd like us to have more of a conversation with you about how best to address it. Is it about simply not having access to that technology at school, although then there's all the hours out with? I think we need to have a big grown-up conversation about how we tackle bullying in this day and age. Alison. I'd like you to walk out of here with your heads held high and to have a sense that you will uh, be true to yourselves and, and that you will all believe that there's an individual within you that has the uh, ability to succeed. Um, I believe that firmly, that everyone has something that they have to give to our community, that you will actually actively be involved in the community in making the change that we need to see, that you will come and, and, and participate in society and in your local community and demand the changes that you need to see. Kez? I'd agree with that. I think it's about seeing the things in the world that make you angry and not just accepting them, but recognising that you as an individual and as a collective have the power to change it. Sometimes that's a political action. Sometimes that, I mean, uh, you know, we've got examples of that uh, in the room today. Uh, you can make a real difference. But the one thing I'd like to see an end to is this idea that there's jobs for the boys and jobs for the girls. It's existed for decades, but it's now an economic imperative that we address it because the jobs of the future, you've heard me talk about this already today, are going to come from science, technology, engineering and maths, the things that women are least likely to do. 
If we don't help you break down those barriers and access those jobs, you'll be locked out of the future that you're entitled to. We simply cannot put up with only 3% of our engineers in Scotland being women. I met somebody in this room today, I can't see them just now, who when asked what do you want to do in your work experience at school said they wanted to go and work on a construction site and they were told by their teacher they couldn't do that. Like, that makes me so angry, I want to change it. And none of you should face any of those barriers this idea that there's jobs for the boys and jobs for the girls. Okay, uh, can I thank you all very much and can I thank you for the questions. Um, I think it's been an absolutely fantastic day. I uh, thank you all for coming. Um, I hope you have been inspired as much as we have been inspired by you. Uh, your diligence, your attention, the questions, your uh, work within the workshops. Um, we have got in front of us an absolutely fantastic young group of women and I know you're going to do brilliant things in the future. Can you join me in thanking our politicians, Kes Dugdale, Ruth Davidson, Alice McInnes and Alison Johnson. <laughs> and our inspirational women, um, Cara, Amal, Khalida, and in addition, Pamela Gillis, who is here today, and Louise MacDonald, who was here earlier today. We helped it in the workshops. Thank you very much. <laughs> this is uh, the first conference we've had. I um, would like to pay special thanks to the Scottish Parliament's own staff, um, the women across the Parliament, from various different jobs who have come together, who have mentored you, who have gone out to your schools, um, who have helped on the day. They have been absolutely wonderful, I think. Um, they have shown the Scottish Parliament and the Scottish Parliament's women's staff in the best possible light. So can I pay my personal thanks to the staff of the Scottish Parliament for all of the work that you have done putting on this event today. Thank you. And can I thank you, of course, all the parliamentary staff, even the ones that aren't women, for the work that they, they have done today. I think it's been absolutely fantastic. Thank you so much for coming. Um, safe journey home. But before we break up, I understand that Andrew, our photographer, um, wants a photograph. So, Andrew, I'm sorry, we don't have a female pho photographer, but Andrew, I'm working on it. Um, <laughs> Andrew, don't be bad to Andrew. Andrew's going to take a photograph. Now, when Andrew tells you to do something, you do it, right? And I'll tell you why. It gets the pain over and done with. And we just do exactly what we're told. Um, we don't have any waste about. So, Andrew, would you like to organise us all for the photograph? Okay, can I ask everyone in the two centre sections, if you could stay where you are, but stand up, if you're able to. The people in this section, if you could move into the spaces, there's plenty of room behind the seats. And people in this section as well, if you're able to move just into the spaces behind, just somewhere in the two centre sections here. Thank you.